Hi, welcome to Simply Nash Media. Today we're going to take a look at the new QNAP TVS EC880. This unit comes in two types of models. There's a Pro model and a U-RP model. The one we're looking at today is the Pro model. The U-RP model is simply a rack mount model with redundant power supplies. That does mean that the Pro model only has single power supplies. Taking a look at this NAS, it's, it's a simple 8-bay tower machine. Um, you can put it into a rack if you'd like, but it's primarily meant as a desktop machine. Um, it does make some noise, it's not for really sitting in your main office environment, it would still sit in, let's say, your server room or wherever your internet access is. Um, main reason for the noise is the spec of the unit. The unit comes with a quad-core Intel Xeon processor clocked at 3.4 gigahertz. Um, it comes with ECC RAM on board, 8 gig stock, goes all the way to 16 gig, which can be expanded here at Simply NAS when you order the NAS from us. Um, main reasoning for this is it's more of a server-grade NAS. Um, initially, this NAS was always meant for a rack mount form factor, but there have been certain instances and market cases where people have preferred a desktop machine. Um, but that doesn't mean they can sacrifice on power, so you've got the TVS EC880. This is a new NAS from QNAP. It does take over from the TS, TS EC880, which is still available. This is, however, a slightly higher spec of a unit. Um, the main reason is, of course, the TVS at the beginning. That stands for Turbo Virtual Station instead of just Turbo Station. Um, the Turbo Virtual Station allows you to do any type of virtualization station with this NAS. You can host, let's say, a Windows Server, for instance, directly off this NAS. Um, that way you don't have to have dedicated hardware anymore for your Microsoft app appliances. Uh, being able to run Windows Server on this NAS via a virtual machine also allows you and enables you to install all of your Office applications, um, your QuickBooks management software, everything can now be installed on this NAS. So it further enhances the usability of a NAS to what we're already used to. Um, taking a look at this NAS, I mean, in general senses, you see the front of the NAS. You've got your, your general hard drive base here. Um, your two bays locked off at the beginning here are what actually takes over on the 10 bay version of this. So this goes over to an EC1080 as well. So you can, if you need two more bays, if you need a little bit more space out of it, you can either go for the 10 bay option too. Uh, bear in mind, you don't have to. All of these NASs are now expandable via JPOD boxes. Um, this one's specifically expandable via USB 3 via the UX series of um, expansion units. Uh, they're just simple NTJ bod boxes that basically plug into a power socket. You expand, connecting the USB port to the back of the NAS, which we'll take a look at, um, and it'll allow you to expand your storage space up to whatever you'd like. Um, looking at the front, you've got your general USB one-touch copy down here. Um, plug in your hard drives, whatever you've got, especially if this is a NAS that you first got. Um, we generally have, if this is your first ever NAS, we generally have data sitting all over on hard drives. Um, copying it over using a PC and the drag and drop method is absolutely fine, you can do it, but it can become extremely cumbersome on you because you have to sit there and watch the hard drives as they get done, switch it over to the next hard drive. You don't want to do six or seven hard drives at a time because it just slows down the speed of the NAS. Um, so what we recommend is the one touch copy. Basically, connect up your hard drive to the one-touch copy at the front and literally just press the one-touch copy button and it will send you an email when it's done. When it's done, you can add another one. The advantage of doing the one-touch copy again is once you've plugged in a hard drive once and set up the backup for that hard drive, it will remember that that hard drive is supposed to be backed up. So next time you bring it in, it'll take it directly into the share folder that you've designated it to. When you do the first ever one-touch copy, you will, it will the NAS will ask you, where you want the data to. Generally, we say dump it all in one share and then organize it afterwards. That way it cap transfers all the data over and then you can organize it into the share folders and directory structure that you so wish it would want to be in. Um, the power button sits on top of the one touch USB copy button. Um, of course, simple. That allows you to power on the unit. It also does allow you to shut down the unit. When you're going to shut down the unit, the best way is always going to be logging to the web UI and manually shut down using the web user interface. However, let's say for whatever reason you have no access, you'll hold that power button for about 1.5 seconds, you get a message on the LCD that lets you know. Um, so you'll hold it down for 1.5 seconds, wait for a beep, and then you walk away from the NAS, it will shut down itself once it's decided to kill off all its services safely and of course securely. Um, aside from that, you've got your LCD that lets you know what's going on with your NAS. It's a quick snapshot, I suppose. It won't let you really know how much, how much your NAS is doing in terms of data transfers, 
that you really need to log into the web UI and look at the dashboard. It will give you information of your IP addresses. Um, it will also allow you to change your IP addresses by pressing the enter button on the screen there and putting in a password, which the default password is 0000. Of course, we recommend you change all your default passwords, be it that one, be it the login for the admin panel too. Um, aside from that, that's generally the front of your NAS. Um, you've also got underneath every hard drive bay, you have your HDD status indicators. When your NAS is on, those will be green when your hard drives are absolutely fine. If something goes wrong, there are two color LEDs that you see. First is yellow, that's to let you know your NAS is on its way out. The second is, of course, red. Red always means stop, your NAS is, your NAS, your NAS is dead, your hard drive is dead. Um, depending on the RAID you do, of course, you'll either protect yourself or you won't. Um, minimum, you should always do a RAID 5 that way, at least you protect yourself from one RAID crash. If you do as high as, let's say, RAID 10, I mean half your bays are redundant. So if one hard drive crashes, you're not even in a degraded state yet. Um, hot spares, good idea, unless you've, all, of course, got a spare hard drive sitting next to your NAS. If you've got a spare hard drive, then don't waste any space doing a hot spare. Typically, you, when you do a RAID 10, we try and avoid people from doing the hot spare because you're just wasting a lot of space. You've already got that redundancy built in. It's best just to buy a cold spare hard drive and have it on the side. Um, Typically, I mean, the only, let's say you've got four terabyte drives in here, your only restriction is four terabyte drive. Um, you can buy whatever brand again if you've, let's say, got HTST in here for now. We recommend you stick with the same brand and the same speed, but let's say for whatever reason, the NAS doesn't fail five, six years down the line, that brand or that speed or that specific drive model is not available. As long as you stick to four terabyte, we'll be absolutely fine. Um, that's generally taking a look at the front of the NAS. Let's take a look at the back of the NAS and then we'll speak some more about it. Okay, taking a look at the back of the NAS, you have um, a plethora of ports on this NAS, unlike other smaller NASs, other desktop NASs. Um, again, this is more of an enterprise unit, so because of that, it'll provide you more functionality. Um, to start with, you've of course got your general power slot there and little PSU fan, which keeps the PSU cool. Um, the PSU is located all the way at the top here. It basically goes, I think, halfway through the unit from here. Um, it's not a small PSU by any means because it's powering an 8-bay enterprise NAS. Um, very rare for them to fail, so it's not something that we're worried about because it's only a single power supply. Um, we typically don't have power supply failures on QNAP. They're very high-quality power supplies. Um, uses your standard standard 3-pin um, PC connector, for instance. The power supply is auto-switching, it goes between 120 volts and 240 volts, so it works here in USA and it works anywhere in Europe as well, um, and of course China and elsewhere. Um, aside from that, you've got your USB ports here. QNAP give you a, a difference of USB ports. You've got, um, you've got six USB 2.0 ports and you've got USB 3.0 ports at the back as well. Um, the USB 2.0 ports are generally utilised for, let's say, keyboards, mouses, um, you can get some USB monitors now as well these days. Um, that way you can log into the NAS without needing network access. The USB 3 ports, I mean, you can use those for a keyboard and mouse, but typically we reserve, we reserve them for either external hard drives or in this case, as we mentioned earlier, the um, expansion units. Um, they will go to the USB 3 port instead of the USB 2 because USB 2 is just too slow for an expansion unit. It won't really get through anything for you. Okay, down here you've also got your HDMI port. Um, the HDMI port basically will allow you to attach a monitor to the NAS. Um, the NAS now allows you to initialize the NAS without network access using the HDMI port. You can actually set up RAID and everything. I mean, you have the LCD at the front to set up RAID, but some people like using the web management panel, so the HDMI will allow you to do that. Um, at the top, you've got two eSATAs. Um, eSATAs are typically only reserved for external hard drives. Um, there's certain external hard drives that only connect up via eSATA. Um, even an internal hard drive you can plug directly in using eSATA, but I mean, we'll never recommend using an internal hard drive externally without a shell. Um, but that being said, that, that functionality is still available if you do use it. It's not really a functionality many people use anymore. But again, as an enterprise NAS, they cover all the bases. Um, that's, brand new, that's basically taking a look at the back of the NAS. Don't forget you've got your two big fans here. This does output a bit of noise, as we mentioned before. Um, to keep the hard drives cool and keep the motherboard cool because the NAS does run at a very high I.O. load. Um, for instance, you can get about 2,500 IOPS out of this NAS at one going time. Um, that does generate a lot of heat. Bear in mind, typically we inter install enterprise drives into this NAS, so they generate a bit more heat as well because they're working a lot harder than your regular hard drive. Bring your rack right to the front, we'll have a few words about the NAS, and then 
we'll also make up the video for you. Okay, bringing you back around to the front, we just mentioned hard drives quite slightly. Let's talk a little bit more about them. Um, typically, this type of NAS, you can install enterprise drives or desktop NAS drives. Um, we don't recommend going anything below and going into, let's say, just a standard desktop drive. Um, main reason being this is a NAS that outputs quite a lot of power if you use the right hard drives. Um, hard drives are very important to a NAS. They depend on the IOs you can get out of the NAS. So don't think because this NAS can give 2500 IOPS, if you put, let's say, a 5400 RPM Western Digital Red Drive in here, you're not going to get those IOs performances because the drive cannot keep up with it. So you'll never get that output. The hard drives are what gives you your output in terms of your data transfer rate because at the end of the day, that's where you are putting your data. The desktop NAS is probably the lowest class you can get in terms of the drive you should put into here. You can get a lot lower class drives, but this is the lowest class you should use. The main reason being there's still 7200 RPM spinning whilst being cost efficient. Um, they do run a little bit cooler than the enterprise drive. Um, aside from that though, I mean, it's really desktop NAS, but typically we recommend installing with the HGSD Ultrastar drives. Um, these are your enterprise drives. Um, we found the HGSD Ultrastar drives to probably be one of the better reliable drives in the industry at the moment, be it in 4 terabyte, 3 terabyte, 2 terabyte, 5 terabyte, 6 terabyte, or 8 terabyte now as well. Um, 8 terabyte drives are fine. I mean, they're very new, so we recommend you can get them if you need it for archive purposes. I'm not sure if you'd want to put it into a data center just yet. I'd give them a couple more months on the marketplace just to figure out all the kinks with the firmware. Um, doing firmware upgrades and drives aren't fun. You don't want to do it when you've already got everything installed in the NAS as well. Um, that's a one hard drive at a time thing. You have to let the re grade rebuild every time you upgrade the firmware of the drive. It's just a cumbersome task. Um, really, at the moment, five, six terabytes, probably the best sweet spot to stay around if you need big data. Remember, you can get expansion units, so it's not as though you're missing out by going to the 8TB drives. You can always add an expansion unit, which is cost efficient. It's not the same as buying a fully loaded NAS. It's not that same price. Um, that being said, I mean, remember, NASes are effectively cheap for what they do nowadays. Um, they're no longer just boxes that you back up data to in and leave data on. Um, I mean, you can run your VM, VMs off here. You can connect this to a server via iSCSI now and use it as an IP SAN as well. So there's a plethora of different things you can do with the NAS. Um, they do have multimedia functionalities, but we won't really touch on that because this is an enterprise NAS. We do have other videos available, for instance, the full bay and the six bay videos that we have done. Those will speak more about the multimedia functionality. You can look at those videos and understand the multimedia functionality. If you want to use this for multimedia, those features still apply to this. Most of the features we speak about, do remember, they apply throughout QTS as opposed to machine-specific. Um, one thing that is machine-specific is, of course, the hardware. Hardware of this cannot be replicated anywhere else. Um, it's only the EC880 series, well, sorry, correcting myself, it's the ECX80 series that carries this hardware. But bear in mind, you have to look for the TVS at the front. There are a couple of different versions now with the TVS and the TS. Um, Depending on what you want to do, of course, if you're not doing any virtualization, then the TS series is enough as well. But, I mean, if you're buying a NAS right now, you might as well go for the biggest and the newest, and that way you've future-proofed yourself. This NAS will probably have about five to ten year lifespan, which is great from a NAS. Typically, we say if you do well than three years, that's awesome. Um, manufacturer warranty is three years standard. Um, you can get extended warranties up to five years. You can get advanced replacement warranties up to five years. So, they do back the NAS. They do have very good confidence in the NAS as well. Um, aside from that, RAID sets we've spoken about, if there are any other questions that you have that you don't feel we've covered in this video, of course send us an email, um, sales at simplynas.com, you can give us a call at 407-960-4690, we're always available and quite happy to answer your questions. Um, if you did enjoy this video, please do subscribe to our channel, that way you get updates when we post other informative videos of this nature. Um, of course, like the video as well, it just gives us a little bit more impetus to do some more videos for you. Um, aside from that, we thank you for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed looking at the TVSEC 880. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. It does help us. It also helps you because we'll send videos out that are of nature of this time. Um, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.